good morning, um, everybody. Good morning, everybody. We are more, man. Thanks so much for yesterday. Um, I found the day fascinating, uh, educative, and inspiring in different kinds of ways, uh, despite all the challenges with regard to our sector being placed on the table. But uh, I had hoped Nobu would be here because Nobu received the Women in Science Award uh, last night from the Ozu, yeah, in the absence. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And then, of course, I had also hoped that the editors of the book would be here because I think it was a great launch last night as well. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. But I also know that some of the university um, academics have, have been trying to get them into other discussions and meetings on the other campuses. So, uh, so maybe we'll see them today, maybe not, I am not so sure. We have to share different sets of intellectual uh, schemes uh, across the space. <coughs> My task is, uh, is simply to, to make a few, uh, or to do a few reflections uh, and before that, of course, also just to recognize, Leboy has joined us. Morning, Leboy. Good morning. And Crane has joined us. Morning, Crane. Morning. Anybody else who has joined us for today? Denise has joined us. <laughs> Give them a hand, all three of them. Yeah. Just getting better, I suppose, eh? The... I picked up a couple of uh, thematic areas um, yesterday, and of course, then we'll, we'll go quickly and make a round to see what it is that you would like to add to those. <clears throat> the one is, and I think that, uh, you know, right throughout the morning session, there's a, a big theme came through that one way to reimagine the university is to reimagine it via a reimagination in relation to its connection to society, okay? The question of, of, of engagement or responsiveness or the civicness of the university as one way of thinking the university <coughs> has come through uh, very strongly. Um, and that was covered, and I'm not going to go through it in terms of the program, that was covered both by Sibongile, by Ahmed, and by Chris as well uh, yesterday. But of course, later on during uh, the session as well, <coughs> covered by Tony. Um, and then Kolisva, of course, brought in the context of, uh, you know, historically disadvantaged university and its additional burden of being othered at an institutional level. Right? So that, that came through. And then, of course, you can connect that even, of course, we, we have uh, given you a hand, Lani, so another hand, there's one of our editors for the book launch yesterday. <laughs> And so that particular thematic area then pulled through into the evening session as well with regard to institutional culture and the, and the black experiences within uh, universities. <clears throat> the question then arose out of the uh, introductory remarks from, the, from Sibongile of whether the notions of the plastic or the porous of the placed university, oh, I'm so sorry about this. Oh, yes, sorry, man. I'm a Bob Marley fan. Eh? Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah. Please switch off your cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the three questions that she also uh, then raised that was taken up in various formats uh, right throughout the day. And I do think that there may be a case to, to make with regard to reimagining the university within the context of its relationship to society. And that particular interface seems to be one key area of work that we can explore. <clears throat> then of course we also had then the kind of setting the scene, you know, from Dina and myself <coughs> around the critical, what would be the meaning of the critical in the context of critical university studies. And out of that, of course, you know, a couple of pragmatic questions were also raised right throughout the day. And all of them seems to return back to the question of institutional culture and how a particular block within the university constrain the transformative projects uh, of universities. 
Now, that has been confirmed by many, many scientific studies as well. Eh? So, so I do think that that particular anecdotal connection can be placed within scholarly work as well. I think that Luan and his team uh, from uh, our outfit has done a great job in mapping the emerging arena of critical university studies uh, with all its different sets of contextual foci you know, uh, across the globe. Uh, and uh, Melatisi tried to explain how Um Khabul is going to work and you know that people have to take small sips. I'm not so sure whether that worked yesterday. <laughs> Everybody seems to take big sips. <laughs> but, of, but of course we had sufficient time, you know, to make provision for the big uh, sips, you know, uh, and of course there was um, some great ideas uh, uh, coming through that as well. The second theme for me, uh, which is related to the first one, is the theme of the unwelcome other, né? which uh, came through powerfully in the book launch yesterday. And of course, the reason why this is a very crucial theme is because if we want to do work around critical university studies, those will probably be the kinds of challenges that one has to work through within the context uh, of the work that we would like to see emerge through those spaces. Uh, and that was very powerful. I was following the Twitter feed this morning as well, and a number of great, great reflections have been made on the book loans uh, uh, last night. <clears throat> and that also linked them back to, to Tolly's uh, in intervention in the morning, and then as well in Karna and Shirley, uh, which brings me back to another theme around the question of whether the anti-racist university is one form of reimagining the university. <clears throat> and whether one can think a kind of emancipatory imagination via the anti-racism project. Um, that, uh, of course, also then linked to the way in which we, at least in the global south, perceive critical university studies emerging in the global north as more or less delinked from the big question of race and more focus on the question of the corporatization uh, and the managerialism project uh, within the current global system. Whether one can argue that point <clears throat> in its totality, I am not sure because I, like everywhere else uh, uh, in the world, there are good practices within university systems that are at, in place, even as we struggle <clears throat> at a macro and meso institutional level to make sense of those. Then the... Uh, Another theme that came through is the question, which I think uh, Tony also raised powerfully, and that was <clears throat> that even if there is a hegemonic frame in place, that there's always room for possible dissident actions, you know, uh, and anti-hegemonic practices uh, to emerge within that. And of course, we all know that that kind of agency has also been proven scholarly in many different kinds of ways, and we can connect that to social reality in much e easier ways. Uh, Michael, of course, also made some great interjections uh, in that regard, but there is a particular <coughs> kind of caution emerging through that uh, that Michelinos put on the table around the, 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 the colonial matrix within which the university is located. And then to have certain forms of undisciplining of knowledge and practices seems to be of a particular uh, tall order in that space. And Michelinos also put forward uh, key points for how one can think a critical university studies program in relation to the experiences of the global north. Then uh, the, the question around the SDGs, uh, Iron, Sue, and Winnie, that put that particular idea on the table, on the, on the, on the PowerPoint there, uh, I found to be very instructive. The one is that the notion of entanglements then came through powerfully. The one is that we work in these massive kinds of friends, and Sue also made that point yesterday, like something like the SDGs. Né? And so imagining the context of the urn, you know, dropping the urn, and the question of rebellion and repair, there is a case to be made, especially with Winnie's intervention that one can drop the SDGs, let it break and rebuild it in different kinds of ways. 
And of course, as you would know, the Africa 2063 agenda tries to do that exactly. That is to drop the SDGs and repackage it in forms that make sense for our continent. And people have been writing a lot about the connection between the SDGs and the Africa 2063 agenda and how that interplay may work. I also think that uh, that particular sharper focus around how we are entangled, and just to refer to what I think was a great lecture by Kolera Mangnu uh, three weeks ago around uh, you know, establishing how Mandela himself was entangled within modernity and tradition and how that shaped his leadership style as he then emerged out in the post-apartheid uh, South African political space. But then, of course, entanglements also uh, designate a form of complicity, i.e. that we are within a system and that we are trying to fathom emancipatory practices, but we are located and we are constrained by certain kinds of regimes that are so powerful in place. And part of the critical university studies and the emancipatory imagination project would be to try and think outside of those kinds of scopes so that one can find better openings for counter practices uh, within the university. The question uh, that was then raised earlier around pragmatics puts a particular kind of responsibility on us as to not only think about how would we network in practical terms to build solidarities across the global south and the global north and within our own country, but how one can think programmatic work that can find some form of expression within the university space. So the, that particular pragmatic work has to be rooted, and I'm so sure of that if I've listened to the contributions, uh, within very sound scholarship. Right? Uh, that is, we will have to drive the intellectual project around what critical university studies within the global south may mean for us to unlock certain kinds of practical uh, uh, expressions uh, for making the work that we would like to see happening in the space uh, emerge. And again, the question of entanglements then, you know, working within and against frames at one at the same time, I think that's probably part of our, our particular reality uh, at the present moment. But that we can, and I do think we can actually develop a sharper social justice frame uh, if we reimagine universities differently and also, also then provide for different uh, options. So the critical also then has to converge with the, converse with the decolonial. Uh, also another point that Michalinos uh, put forward yesterday in so many different kinds of ways. And just to share with you that in this African space, there is a huge um, debate around whether the decolonial project as it has emerged globally can serve the global South and Africa in a way that we think it should. Right? And that the notion of Africanization, the critical and the decolonial need to be in a particular kind of conversation with one another. A point then that Michael raised earlier about excavating African intellectual paradigms and regimes within that space. Right? And most of the critiques against the decolonial in the African space actually have that particular kind of angle. Right? So there's another uh, kind of debate on the table. And the idea that one has to then study the university, and this is particularly the interest uh, for, our, for our work here, whether we can put forward a different way of studying the university. Right? Uh, a way of studying the university that look at power, privilege, the distribution of worth, recognition, and so on, in different kinds of spaces, and what that particular kind of study then may look like. And I'm now at my last point, and I'll uh, just uh, check with you whether you would have anything to add to that. Um, we will have, uh, Dina and I, different kinds of uh, bilateral uh, meetings with people. Uh, there will be separate dinners and all those kinds of things, and, and we will try and make sense of how we can, at a practical level, drive a form of network that can hold these uh, ideas and people together as we uh, pursue uh, uh, the project around emancipatory imaginations and a 
critical university studies from the perspective of the of the global south. Okay, uh, but you will be you will be uh, uh, consulted <laughs> on that. Okay, okay, right, lovely. Um, am I capturing that in a way that makes sense to you? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Uh, anybody else who have uh, particular reflections? And remember now, uh, in fact, I didn't, uh, I didn't follow the principles of Mkhabulu. I took a long sip. <laughs> I took a long sip, but maybe I should ask you <laughs> to try and stick to that. Anybody else? Who So I think we all, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to breathe out and to breathe in yeah, okay. and to enjoy the laughter. Okay. Thanks, sir. Ahmed? Anybody else? And you know, I forgot to acknowledge Babawa and Kawe. Sorry, comrades. Eh? They're the two colleagues of ours that also joined. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have a particular kind of reflection, question, idea? Dina, oh. you, you want to add something? Um, that perhaps there wasn't a sense that everyone can sip, so everyone can try and can contribute. And I think even if you've been asked to speak on a panel, please don't feel that you can't speak later in the space. Um, and so, of course, we're here, we're rooted in South Africa, and our South African colleagues will, of course, dominate, root, bring it back to the issue of South Africa. But there are colleagues from other parts of the continent who I think should also challenge and really contribute, please, and then other parts of the world, so that we do make sure we're actually making connections now while we have the, the chance. So please do, do sip, if you know what I mean. Don't feel that you cannot or you must sit and only listen and like, definitely be part of this conversation is what I would say. Okay, oh lovely. Right, is that the two? Right. Okay, then Copano. You are. Yeah, you are here, yeah, my brother. You have to come to the fore, Copano. Sue and Kawe, please join us here. You do your introductions, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning from me. We are following on a day of uh, what Andre has summarized, what uh, an amazing day it was yesterday, and all the inputs. The thing is, uh, globally, across Africa and uh, in South Africa in particular, the left is, has never had such amazing possibilities. Precisely the moment where you have uh, Salvino, where you have uh, Erdogan, where you have, uh, I call him Boris Yeltsin, uh, always. I, I, uh, I mention Yeltsin instead of uh, Boris Johnson, where you have uh, Trump. And we had nine years and a bit of, uh, of uh, Chief Comrade Zuma. But the left, precisely at this moment, uh, the possibilities offered in 2016 for us here, for the university, for the higher education system um, are incredible. Um, 
And so uh, what we want to talk about today are options. Well, the brief says the options are unethical, are unsustainable, they have narrowed. But what I've just said is in this discursive field, the kinds of discourses that are unsustainable, that are unethical, are also giving us an opportunity to reimagine, to rethink, to bring about different kinds of, of options, different kinds of, of connections between the university and uh, its gates. You will uh, know that over time, for instance, if you take in South Africa universities such as Maritzburg, the campus in Maritzburg, at one point it was open. Um, if you drive um, people who know Maritzburg, for instance, uh, but also Vets, it was open at some point, but at some point the, the gates closed. You have to go through a boom gate. And so we exist in this moment when the university is closing down, and so you have to open up the options that we do. What we want to talk about, and what Kawegaz and Sue are going to talk about, what I'm looking forward to is, although we want to talk about discourses, discursive fields, um, some people on the left have spoken that you cannot separate the discourses, as some people do, from materialities, from the bodies that enter the gate, from the bodies sitting in the classroom, from the bodies who teach, who write, and, uh, and that sort of thing. The bodies that take care, that take care of things. I don't know whether you're gonna be talking about that, but I wish you would, I wish you would uh, you'd talk, you'd talk a little bit about that. Uh, the invisible labor, uh, of the outsourced workers that students have forced to be insourced, which is important, the, the bodies that exist, the configuration of the buildings, of the, of the work in which we work. And one last thing before, uh, you, you have seen the, the, the bios, so perhaps you will not, uh, but if you wish, you can, you can just introduce something that's not in the bios. What I'm also looking for, perhaps we will hear is, there are two kinds, there's another kind of discussion happening here. We, we talk about the university in capital U, the university. And I've said this, that sometimes it is easier to talk about the university in capitals rather than speak, sp speaking specifically about the university in a small letter. That's your university, the kinds of practices of discourses that prevail, that govern the options within the university. Um, so I'm hoping we'll, we'll also be talking about these this kinds of the university, you know, critical university studies as a, as a, as a kind of broad uh, field, but also how it, it descends on a particular space, Marisbeck University, University of Natal, Marisbeck, KwaZulu-Natal, Marisbeck, UNISA, UNISA in the papers, Jonathan Johnson wrote about this yesterday's paper, I understand, I just wrote, I read one paragraph about that, about Nelson Mandela Universities and the kinds of possibilities from one particular space that can be lifted up then uh, as what we call with my students decolonizing experiments. So you pick up an experiment in one environment and you lift it up and says, this is perhaps an option we can look into. Kawegase, Sue, who wants to start? Um, you can, we have enough time, an hour and a half, we've been allocated, we wanna take all of it, <laughs> all. Of that, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. No, no. I'm closing down the options. <laughs> we have that. Can take ten minutes, and then we get uh, a little bit. Come in maybe for five minutes, and then end up with another three minutes at the end of closing. Is, is that okay with you? All right. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Kawegazima Kabuk, um, and I am a lecturer in the sociology department uh, oh. here at Nelson Mandela University. Uh, and I'm also doing, I'm a PhD candidate at UWC, writing about uh, sociology of health, trying to theorize care from an indigenous point of view, using indigenous language like inkatalo, nukatala nesandla, nimbaton, what those mean to care. So removing care from the global north and using, you know, care from the global south and what we understand about it. So care is quite central to my work. So the discussion today that I want to bring is about, you know, this paradox of visibility and invisibility, especially for uh, black women in higher education. And it sort of uh, picks up the stone from the conversation that we had yesterday about the experiences that black women have, uh, about sort of narrating our experiences of this space and the bodies who occupy the space and what this means for us. So 
my presentation today is quite um, autobiographical because obviously I'm using my own experiences as a benchmark of how I interpret and see this space as someone who's recently come into the space. So this, this idea of visibility and invisibility um, is quite central to um, my um, experience. So this idea that uh, from, this idea that the work that becomes invisible, the work that is unacknowledged that you do a lot of, almost the care work that you carry in with you through these spaces and how you navigate these spaces. So my work is quite um, influenced by this um, uh, Nimal uh, Poe's work on space invaders, on coming into spaces that weren't necessarily designed for you and you become visible but invisible in the work that you do and the kind of invisibility that I'm talking about is this idea of um, maybe, I, I mean, let me start with the story. I once told my colleagues I was having trouble in class with my students. And they said, maybe if you dressed a little bit older. <laughs> this idea of, I am visibly here, you can see me. The transformation project calls for me to be here. I'm the next generation of academics. But maybe if I dressed a little bit older, the burden of doubt would be lifted. And it is this entanglement that you talk about, Andre, that you're visibly here, but invisibly you're not here. That the students continue to see you, but it's a constant, you know, if you dressed a little bit older, maybe you'd get respect. If you dressed a little bit older, maybe you wouldn't have issues of sexual harassment, which I was, you know, exposed to, where students started whistling when I entered the classroom. I am visibly here in the space I occupied, but do you really see me? Am I, am I, am I tick box? Am I part of the, the tokenism of transformation? I'm really here, but do you really see me? Or am I part of the furniture that you now see? Or maybe it's a part of hyper visibility, right? I'm here. And academic labor is more than just the understanding of you teach and you do research. It's layered. It's entangled in the way that you must do it. It's also about providing care to the students who walk into your office. And this, and this, I premise this idea of this ontological recognition in the student to you, that they see you as much as you see them. So it's It's different from, you know, this idea that you see me, but it's premised on, a, on, 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 on heaviness of born. You recognize my humanity. Ubuntu bamu ya bubona. And these are the kinds of ontological recognition that I'm talking about when I talk about visibility at least to my students. And one colleague once said to me, I think you're over consulting. You've always got people in your office. I think you're over consulting. But what my colleague failed to recognize was this ontological recognition that as much as they see me and they see me through themselves, I see myself through them. And it becomes then an extra burden of care. It becomes what Glenn Nagano talks about, a coercion of care. It's not a, a, a natural thing that you do, but it is premised on this ontological recognition that you and I both share, a historical understanding of our place in society and our place now as space invaders in this new space that calls us to be here, that calls on this idea of care, an extra layered kind of care. So then, when my other colleagues say, if you dressed a little bit older, I ask myself, it's calling for me to perform in this space, right? It's calling for me to be more visible than I am because I thought, you know, you could all see me. But it's also layered, sorry. <clears throat> so then the hyper visibility in that if you dressed a little bit old, older is also layered in this idea of the committees that you must now fill, right? It is almost the weaponization of youth. That when you are a young academic, we, you're so vibrant, you're so energetic, we're going to put you on the marketing committee, you're going to go and you're going to get these students to come to Nelson Mandela, you're going to... It's almost, while your youth is, a, is part of the transformation agenda, you must be here. It is also a hyper-visibility in that you must come and recruit those people, but yet you do not see me. I, am I really here in this space? But then, when it comes to research, I, re I remain invisible because it's the young academics who do much of the teaching. And it is the professorate who are the researchers. So it is my youth that you love, but it is also my youth that holds me back. 
It's a double entang entanglement of my youth, and it is weaponized for me and against me. And my youth is also, while called into the spaces for transformation, is a question of doubt. And I call this the idea of the body system. Another funny story. So I was once asked, a colleague of mine arrived, a new colleague arrived. And one of the senior people, senior management, said to me, I think, actually wrote in an email, I think you should buddy up with this woman who's now coming. And I will ask for the professor to oversee this. And I asked, how many other people are part of this buddy system? Am I the only one who must do this buddy project because it is new to me? And I was told, no, it's a form of mentorship. But this is only reserved for black women. <laughs> Nobody else, and why must I report to the professor? It is this idea of surveillance, this doubt again. You are here in this space, go and mentor somebody, go and be a buddy to somebody else, but it is also this idea of somebody else whom the system recognized, whom is not a space invader like yourself, has credibility, has paid their dues, must oversee it. It's an added layer of this weaponization of my youth. My youth is enough to mentor somebody else, but it is not enough for me and to be trusted in the system because I must report to someone who's senior outside of the confines of my academic labor. So it is this entanglement of visibly being in the space, but am I really here in the experiences that I see? So this idea of doubt and the, and the added idea of the perpetual development project. A lady on the panel yesterday talked about this idea, you're constantly on the cusp. This idea that you become this, de this perpetual development program. You are constantly emerging. You never get to the top. Where is the emergence? You become this, no, no, no. We'll get someone to look after what it is that you're doing. But then now having explained all of these things, we must ask ourselves, how do we reimagine this university, right? But we need to create communities of coping because ours, and like as Kosen, it is not an individual experience. It is an experience shared by many black women. This paradox of visibly being here, of being recognized, but being invisible in the ways that really count. But it is also layered, this visibility and invisibility, to the institutional cultures and institutional languages that you are othered out of, you have not learned them, will let somebody else teach you because it is these institutional cultures and institutional languages, a particular language so specific that it is like some people were having a conversation and you weren't privy to it. And it is this weaponization of this language that you are othered from, of these experiences. And institutional culture lay, layers at least the bedrock of understanding your place as a space invader into this space. So then we must create these communities, of, these communities of coping, where we share our experiences and reimagining the university. That if we are to do real transformation, it must not be about tokenism, about one, two, three, oh, there you are. But it must be, it must mean something. It must not also be a performance of hyper-visibility of, oh my God, we need you, there you are, oh, we need you, there you are. And we keep recycling the same faces. It must be a concerted effort of trying to get as many people who are other from the system into these spaces so we can create these communities of care in reimagining the space. So for me, that is all that I think that I have to offer. Am I good? I have one minute, oh, okay. But I think I'm good? Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I think um, before I start, and I've got my notes unfortunately on my laptop and not printed out, so I'm going to be tucked behind a screen. But before I start, I just want to um, pick up on, because I'm very much talking at more discursive level than the personal level, but I do want to first pick up on something Kawakazi has said. And that is from a position as a sort of aged white professor. What can, what can, what role do I have to play in in this um, experience that's just been handed to us? And 
I mean, I think the, the, the big issue around the, the burden of doubt that is experienced by so many young black academics and the performativity that is exper experienced and the, and the absolute lack of spaces of failure. You just cannot, you cannot stuff up. Um, and the only thing I can think of in terms of using my privilege, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more, but the thing I can think of straight away is the responsibility that I have and that people like me have to, to turn the surveillance away from our young black colleagues and to turn it towards our established white colleagues. I do think that there are real questions to be asked about workloads, about who gets um, to skip all the first year marking. I think there are real questions to be asked about protected employment. Um, that we've, I've got colleagues, I've got some brilliant colleagues, wonderful colleagues. Um, some of my best colleagues are white. But, um, but there are a lot of there are a lot of colleagues. You don't you don't get challenged in the same way if you're an established white academic. You can stuff up. It'll be explained at an individual level and not at a group level, and that's where I think we have responsibility. Those of us that look like me, so we have responsibility to turn the surveillance, perhaps, in another direction if we're going to be busy in this whole world of surveillance at all. And then um, to pick up on Capano's point, which I, I think is, is what I'm going to be talking to, um, one of the questions that came up yesterday repeatedly is who is the university? And uh, the topic of this particular panel is about the way in which our agency is constrained by the dominant discourses of our universities. And as Capano said, you can't separate discourses though from, from bodies. I think it's a mistake to think that the world is languaged into being separate from the agency. The, the real sort of materiality of discourse is that, that we are the people who are using those discourses. I think it's very much easier to speak about the university. Um, it's a cop-out. I hear it a lot in these workshops. I, I run courses across South African universities and I often hear academics saying, well, they should do this or they should do that. And I, I'm not sure who they is. We hear the vice chancellors yesterday saying, you know, the university is not the vice chancellors. And, and, um, but but we've, all been, we've all been complicit in this process of turning it into the university and they. You know, we've been very complicit in, in um, undermining the role of Senate. We've been complicit in turning deans and to executive deans. We've, we've been party to every step along the way. And of course this happens because the university, as we said yesterday, exists in society and the university is of society. We assure us ourselves, as higher education staff and students, that we are part of a social structure that's going to bring about change in the world. In a world that's absolutely replete with environmental degradation and human cruelty. And we kind of assure ourselves that this is what the university is for. But the university reinforces the social order, even while it's promising to address human equality, inequality. The university separates the privileged from the poor, even while it researches how to create parity. So we are deeply complicit. And we should also acknowledge at the same time that major changes in political, social, and economic orders throughout history have largely come from outside of the university walls. Not to say that we're not involved, we are in society, but I think we mustn't, uh, we mustn't pretend for a moment that we are sort of the, the vanguard of, of societal change. We will get to cheer and to weep, and then we get to record and to research the changes in society. And I think in all our hand-wringing and reflection, I think we mustn't forget the limits of our power to bring about change. So basically I'm saying higher education is complicit in the power, uh, problems of society and that it's not the primary driver of change in society. But from that rather negative starting point, I don't want to suggest that we accept the status quo inside or out of our universities. I think there's a lot to be done and I think there's a lot that we can do. And I think it's only though once we actually confront our complicity head on that we can start to reimagine the role of, of higher education in society's transformation. And I think critical university studies demands that we do confront it. So the title of this session, right, in what ways do the dominant discursive fields of higher education constrain the renewal and transformation of the academy? I think that a key way 
is that most people working in university do not see themselves in the business of confronting anything, let alone our own complicity. So the first thing we need to confront, anyone who works in a university or goes to a university, the first thing we need to confront is that all around the world, there is one thing that correlates to higher education, success. This is true across all eras, all systems, and all geographies. It's not gender, race, or language, although intersectionality very clearly allows us to identify the role of how society's construction of gender, race, and language play an uh, intersectional role. The consistent correlation to higher education success is social class. Everywhere, middle class students succeed, and working class students do so with far less regular regularity. And we do not want to acknowledge this. So what we do to help protect ourselves from having to acknowledge our role is that we allow ourselves to believe that higher education is a meritocracy. I think that this is the most dominant discourse in our universities. And I think this is the discourse that most clearly constrains our possibility of being a social structure for public good and keeps large aspects of the university as a social structure for public bad. We lack to believe that strong students who put in the effort will succeed. Students who are weak or lazy will not. And to keep this fiction alive, we latch on with great excitement and joy to those success students, those success stories of students who've achieved the dream against all the odds, those that have gone from rags to riches. But if we are truly to make higher education system just, we need to confront the extent to which our assumptions about knowledge construction, literacy practices, and more do not reflect our student body. And epistemological access is a challenge very unevenly experienced as we currently constitute epistemology and ontology. And it's not a South African problem. It's true in Saudi Arabia, it's true in Sweden, it's true in Senegal. Rather than acknowledging that higher education success correlates with and reinforces the large social structures and their intersectionality, particularly social class, which would require us to rethink every aspect of our curricula, we hold on fast to the notion of the university as a meritocracy. Some research I've done over the years with Chrissy Bowie and I, we've identified what we call the discourse of the decontextualized learner. And in our meta-analysis of teaching and learning in South Africa, we found this to be the most dominant explanation in South African universities for success and failure. This discourse of the decontextualized learner explains student success or failure emerging from attributes inherent in the student. They succeed because of their levels of motivation, their proficiency in the English language, and even their intelligence, although this latter was never as crudely stated as that. It was said things, it was like, well, you know, those students are very bright, or shame, she's a bit dim. In our everyday language, we position, and it's not just our everyday language as academics, it's our everyday language in our policies and so on, and in the structures of our institutions. We position student success or failure as emerging from what they bring in their bodies. We decontextualize those bodies from the values, norms, knowledges, and social practices. And by decontextualizing our student body from student society, we are also able to absent the university by treating it as neutral, common sense, and therefore outside the critical gaze. I know I'm not saying anything new, but I, I think that we just need to really face it head on. So I think there, there are a lot of other discourses in the academy that align with and, and bolster this discourse of meritocracy and the decontextualized student. And in particular, the human capital theory of education positions the university in what I view as very problematic ways because it limits the possibility of the university to address transformation. I think we've been captured by this way of thinking about the relationship between skills, the economy, and education. The knowledge economy. Knowledge can be packaged and traded. Skills are key to building the knowledge economy. Higher education is the space of provision of high-level skills. 
I think in this instrumentalist approach of human capital theory, education is really the handmaiden of economic growth, and there's no questioning about the da damage that's done by the current conceptualization of economic growth. So the underpinning assumption is, of course, that there are or there will be jobs if only graduates would have the right skills and the right graduate attributes. And this particular understanding of the role of higher education, of course, emphasizes its private good nature. It ignores the role of higher education as something that's meant to be good for society at large, or something that's meant to serve our ailing planet on which we live. In the human capital theory of education, higher education is mainly or exclusively something for the benefit of those few lucky students who study at our institutions because we can provide them with social mobility through skills which they can use to negotiate better jobs and incomes in service of industry. So it's very easy to then see why the state would cut funding. Why should the taxes from all the people of this country be used to, study, to subsidize the studies that will benefit the few students and, and industry, which is a profit-making endeavor? And it's this logic that led to the massive increases in student fees and, of course, we know the relationship to the fees and falls protests. But, of course, spending cuts by the state on higher education, it's not peculiar to South Africa. Once Reagan and Thatcher adopted uh, Friedman's version of neoliberalism, practically the entire world's higher education system followed a very particular path, and it's playing out in different ways across the planet. Staggering student debt in America, sit-ins in, in various parts of Europe, and so on. And, and the rapid increase in for-profit higher education, which we're seeing in this country as well. And the unbundling of higher education, our public institutions, which we're seeing in this country as well. The impact of, high, of human capital theory is enormous, even though there is consistent evidence of its shortcoming. In South Africa, for example, despite a doubling of graduates in the last 20 years, we continue to see increases in unemployment and slow economic growth. But the theory is never questioned. Instead, we told the problem is that the higher education institutions are hopelessly out of tune with providing the relevant skills that lead to employment and economic growth. Feedback from industries is that universities are failing to provide the precise kind of labor that can hit the ground running as they enter the workplace. And so our universities rush to greater and greater evidence, skills training, employability, entrepreneurship, yada, yada. I do not want to deny the existence of a graduate premium. It's a measure of the extent to which obtaining a particular qualification increases individuals' chances of employment, salary, promotion, blah, blah, blah. It's actually very high in South Africa, although it's almost evaporated across the United Kingdom, and it's rapidly declining elsewhere too. Higher education does indeed offer many individuals social mobility in South Africa, and, and who am I to, to, to question that? And with this social mobility, some graduates will indeed access the goods of a hyper-capitalist society. But is this really the core goal for all our students? Is this really the core goal of our institutions? I think the error of extrapolating from a few individuals who've enjoyed social mobility through obtaining a qualification to suddenly making claims about the purpose of the entire system of higher education is problematic, and yet it's commonplace. So, there's a lot that I can say on this issue, um, but I know that I've already probably spoken for more time than I meant to. So, in my very brief and perhaps oversimplistic response to the question, in what ways do the dominant discursive fields of higher education constrain the renewal and transformation of the academy, I would say that the key ways are through the discourse of meritocracy, its twin, the decontextualized learner, and through the discourse of the knowledge economy and its twin, human capital theory. Thanks. The mic, uh, Romy mic, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm encouraged, four, four hands, I see. Um, Sue has summarized uh, that part, so I don't have to do that. Uh, about two or three or four things. Complicity, this is where she starts. She speaks about the discourses that narrow the options, including meritoc meritocracy and the discourses of human capital. And, and she has made a, a wonderful link here, by the way. We have been talking about the relationship between the, the university and uh, society, but one of the forces in society is, are the, the employers, capital, that says that uh, these are the sorts of things that you have been doing. So in that sense, closing down the kinds of options that, that some of us, particularly the left, as I said, would want to, to take up. That's the, so Sue has done 
wonderful thing bringing that in, so we have to, to talk a, a bit about that. However, the three things, uh, and I like because you lifted and spoke a lot about discourses, but Kawagas was speaking about materialities, bodies, uh, youth. Uh, in addition to the anti-racist university, by the way, this is a fourth point that you, you were mentioning, but you didn't quite, uh, well, it's, it's there, it's always there, and, and uh, we, we are doing this, this work with our students, well, I'll mention in a short while. In addition to the anti-racist university and what uh, Luan was saying yesterday, the anti-sexist university, you, you have to have this. This is, a, this is an incredible problem we face in South African universities. And so the, this work we've been doing is, is, is equality, which connects with meritocracy. Is equality possible at university? Uh, is this idea that we live with uh, possible? So we're thinking about masculinities uh, and femininities within the university and this production, and reproduction of inequality slash equality. And, and whether it's possible, and the more we do this work, you have a, in this country at least, uh, in other countries, including the Nordic countries, you have this discourse of equality, but it, the materiality of it, the livedness of it, it, in, it doesn't exist. You're confronted with violence, with homophobia, queer students and trans students are, are battling every day they, from the simple things like toilets, for instance. They, they, they don't exist, toilets for, for queer and trans students. So that's a, that was one, uh, about materialities, and I like it, then there's this two levels. Um, and Anderson, in counseling psychology a while back, the, the African-Americans brought, brought to the table that concept where you started. That the moment you're thought as a superwoman, a super black woman, or so hyper visibility, Patricia Williams, you might remember, did this as well in the train, that incident that she relates in the train. If you're thought as hyper visible, at that very moment, you're invisible because you are not taken as an ordinary part of things. You are a thing out of place, or you have to be underneath, right? As uh, Tanahisi Coates would say, you are the life underneath, and you always want to battle and not, not, be, not be the superwoman, the superman. Uh, you don't, because at that moment, you become invisible. Um, so that's a, that was a good point just to bring, bring onto the table. And then you spoke about then uh, communities of coping. Um, I know that the University of Cape Town in particular has had a, has had a policy work around this, around care and, and mental health. It's a huge thing at universities, particularly now we know it from the 2016, uh, 2015, 2016. And uh, my students have, I have, uh, have also, my students have, have staged this about, so how do we create this communities <laughs> of coping? Once again, just one last word, I've been saying this, this and, and ties to Sue's things, that and in two parts, what would men, in particular, this male-bodied persons, this do to support students, young female students in particular, but also queer and trans students, what should they be doing and why it's important to do this? So well, for me, I guess, and for uh, many of us, it's clear why you need to do this, why you need to, to engage men, other men, engage the system structures to support women scientists, and somebody says they are not women scientists, they are scientists, but hang on, we still have to, to put the adjective there so that we know what, what we, you know, to, to pin it down, so that it is important why uh, the male professoriate has to do this work, particularly, well for me, particularly black male professors, they have to do this, you have to bring into your space the conditions, the first non-negotiable, the students who come in to the university in your department, into your faculties, are safe. That's a, that's, a, that's a big project, that they are safe, they're free, they're unruly as they want to be, they challenge you and, and they do this sort of work. This is really an important part of the work that agents, that you can do, that we can do. Uh, of course it applies to, 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 to female professors, it applies to, to white, the white left, to white colleagues to do this sort of work. And, and it is, in that moment, possibilities are opened up. Can we take about uh, 30 minutes or whatever, just khabulang and speak? Eh, no, no, Andre, put your, put your watch down, okay. <laughs> okay, all right.
Thanks very much. I hope I can help a bit with the meritocracy story. And I can quote from a recently retired academic uh, this book. The word meritocracy was made up. It was made up in 1958 by a man called Michael Young. Michael Young wrote a book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. And his whole point was that the word meritocracy was an insult. It was not a compliment. And he lived quite a long life, Mr. Young. In 2001, he commented on the way the word meritocracy had made itself into ordinary discourse. And this is what he said. So this is the man who invented the word meritocracy. He said, I have been sadly disappointed by my 1958 book, The Rise of the Meritocracy. I coined a word which has gone into general circulation, especially in the United States, and have most recently found a prominent place in the speeches of Mr. Blair. Remember Mr. Blair? The book was a satire meant to be a warning, which needless to say has not been heeded. It is highly unlikely that the Prime Minister has read the book, but he has caught on to the word without realizing the dangers of what he is advocating. It is good sense to appoint individual people to jobs on their merit. It's the opposite when those who are judged to have merit <coughs> of a particular kind harden into a new social class without room in it for others. Ability of a conventional kind which used to be distributed between the classes more or less at random has become much more highly concentrated by the engine of education. That's us, the engine of education. A social revolution has been accomplished by harnessing schools and universities to the task of serving people according to education's narrow band of values. With an amazing battery of certificates and degrees at its disposal, education has put its seal of approval on a minority and its seal of disapproval on the many who fail to shine from the time they are relegated to the bottom streams at the age of seven or before. The new class has the means at hand and largely under its control by which it reproduces itself. Thank you, Chris. Beware of the discourse of meritocracy. Thank you. I like uh, to thank the panel for bringing up these different aspects of thinking about the university, university as a place of encounter and disencounter, but especially also, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if I pronounce your name right, Kawasaki. I would like to congratulate you for your analysis of thinking, ontologies of thinking, uh, academic labor as affective labor as a continuation of domestic and care work. Um, we always forget that the university is a place of the division of work, the gendered, racialized division of work. Um, we see cleaners. We never ask who are the cleaners in German university, usually migrant women, black women. That's the most representation, actually, of migrant and black uh, population in Germany when you look at the cleaners. The first one, and I know that in, in South Africa there have been solidarity with the cleaners in the university when there was the, the student strikes, which uh, I am also very, um, yeah, very uh, moved by it because we don't have this kind of debates in Germany. But also the first outsourcing of, act, of uh, people working in the university starts with the cleaners. The interesting part what you told us now and what we heard also yesterday uh, in the book launch is that when one becomes an academic, depending of the class, depending of your race, religious position in the societies you live, you continue to be a domestic worker uh, or a cleaner. My mother is also a domestic worker, so part of me be, uh, being in the space in Germany in the university is the daughter of the domestic worker is sitting here. So, and I think it's very important because the material labor and labor that we do, and also, as you said, as a, as a teacher, as a lecturer, being addressed by, and yesterday that was also a topic, how it never ends because it's a space of class. 
is a pl space where some are used to have servants at home, and so they become professors, and this kind of idea of servitude continue. But when you're used to be this one that has served, or in your family you have this history, and you encounter it in a place that's supposed not to have it anymore, that's, I think, quite interesting, and the affective part that goes with it, that injuries, the vulnerability. So I'd like just to congratulate you, and I think it's a very important work to demystify it. Mm -hmm. the whole idea of the university as a place of knowledge. It's also a place of affects, it's a place of encounter, and Shirley has done a lot of work on affect uh, and what it means, but especially when we do very concrete, everyday labor. Mm -hmm that it's about labor that has been invisibilized, mm -hmm. labor that never has been paid until today, mm -hmm. looking at domestic and care, we're always looking at how the non-human human in society has been constructed mm -hmm. and how it's continued. continued. And in, in, in Europe, especially through migrant labor, through also indocumented migrants that are not even part of, of the university system. We have laws that actually forbids the people study. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that the yesterday's spirit continues, but can you pass on the, uh, you know, the, the sip? <laughs> That's all. That's all. Okay. Um, um, I think uh, for me, um, today and yesterday has been quite a depressing experience when I hear uh, about women and how women, you know, I thought my experiences in the early 2000s and in the 90s, those things are over. But when I hear young people speaking about the same thing, I'm actually quite depressed and, and, and very, I'm very, very sad about it. And um, I think when we're talking about discourses, it seems that one of the discourses we haven't put on the table is the discourse of white supremacy, which continues to embed transformation in, in higher education at the moment. So that is not over, and people have the tendency to say racism is over. It actually isn't over. And unless we put that discourse back on the table and just say it is still there, we are never going to transform and the transformation that we are engaging on in at the moment at the moment is going to be unsustainable because of that. Thank you. Okay, I'll make sure to take a sip. Um, my sister, the work you do um, it is greatly appreciated, and I've always been really passionate that uh, men of colour in particular need to help our sisters more. So it's so important. It's not your responsibility to tell us what to do in terms of what we could do better, but um, where we should be better allies and we are in debt to you. So please let us know what we can do to better support you, one, because I think what you do is unbelievable and it gives people like me a platform to have that admittedly I don't deserve and it's come off the back of your labour. So thank you so much. Um, and secondly, um, and it's a quick one, uh, so, you, uh, thank you very much for your presentation as well. You made a point about class being the most dominant discourse. And my only gripe with this is that I think that class, this is the same kind of narrative in the UK, and it almost makes everyone like a victim of that. And I say that because 72% of the UK classes themselves as working class. So that narrative is like the white working class suffer as much as, and I think when we go into that hierarchy of intersectionality, it, it's quite, um, it devalues race, because if you use an intersectional approach, if you conflate that, if we just use class as the barometer, it's always going to be worse for someone that is, you know, f from a gender background, race background, disability, religion. And so I'm always kind of, I always feel people use class as a safe ground, but the truth is class doesn't affect everyone in the same way, whether they are working class or middle class. Like, well, let's work from a working class basis. So it, I just think it's something to think about because I think within the UK and I think in a South African context, potentially, class always gets positioned at, that at the top of the hierarchy in terms of sectionality. And it's like, that's the most important issue. Um, the truth is, if you conflate it against racism, which I think is at the bottom of the hierarchy, then I think you know that's a serious problem. And I sometimes feel like racism or race is trivialised against class. I'm not to, I'm not saying that you did that, 
Um, but in the UK, this is like the most dominant narrative and it's just really hard to listen to that when you're a black working class person. Kapana, can I can I quickly answer? Can I quickly respond to that one? Because thanks, because I think that I think that's absolutely key, and I'm very very concerned about where I raise this issue, because it's so easy then to be read as oh well, um, yeah. It's very firstly class is something that a lot of people identify with, and working class is such a misnomer anyway, because um, yeah yeah. Have, what does working mean? Um, but the reason I raise that here is because. What we, what we see happening is, let me try and, let me try and sort of think as, I, as I'm talking. What we see happening is, and this is, yeah, I'd be very careful of saying this to a more conservative group of people, because I think then it's a convenient cop-out. But the reason why I want to say it here is because it speaks back to the racist, and, and yeah, so I'm very careful where I say it and what audience I said to. But if I say it here, I'm hoping that it allows us to speak back to the very conservative notions that this is somehow to do with someone's uh, skin color or gender. It's not, it's about how society positions people of certain skin colors and genders, and they position them along social class lines. I mean, we get the exceptions, and we've got social mobility, and we've got a black middle class in South Africa, but. By and large, you know, when we're talking race and gender and class, those things work entirely intersectionally. So, yeah, I'm not, ex not expressing myself very well, but I will say that I'm very concerned about your point that by foregrounding the extent to which the university assumes a whole lot of literacy practices and knowledge that may be, may be um, uh, related to class, that, um, that that would allow us to say, oh, I'm not racist. This is not about race. This is not about gender. This is, you know, my students had terrible schooling. So, um, yeah, as I say, I'm not expressing it very well, but I'm, I'm very aware that these things work intersectionally. Kawegase, before uh, Michael comes up, please, do you want to take a bite first? So because... Sorry, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is depressing. <laughs> it really is depressing, and I agree with you. It is a continuation of being maids and this continuation of like, you know, of servitude. There's a lot of servitude. And servitude goes well, like, hand in glove with this idea of managerialism, where, you know, students are like, well, if you don't do something, I'm gonna get someone above you to change it. It almost, it almost goes so well with the way that the university is sort of developing, right? This corporatized idea of it, that essentially, you know, oh, well, no, it's fine. I'm gonna, no, actually, you know, if you, okay, you, no, you don't want to sort out my marks, fine. I'm going to get somebody else above you to tell you what to do. And essentially, you know, I'm paying you. You're supposed to do this. And, you know, it's these kinds of things that we're constantly confronted by, and how does transformation work in that way? Because you're here in the space, but I continue to have, you know, this burden on me. And it's, it's almost, a, a, I don't know if it's even a double-edged sword. I mean, there are lots of swords now that we're talking about. <laughs> So these are the kinds of things. Okay, but I think that's it. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, my name is Michael, Michael Cross. Um, I'm not sure that I remember what I want to say because <laughs> the age is really, you know, hitting on me. <laughs> um, let me start with the question that I want to ask. The question I want to ask is how do we create and or shape a counter discourse. I'm saying that because that's our major challenge in everything that you said. And I'm saying that because uh, one of our colleagues one day just about two weeks ago uh, came to me and he said, Michael, you know, the problem in South Africa is that we stuck with epistemologies because of the debates which are dominant at this stage. I could say we stuck with dominant discourse, still trying to unpack them. We haven't done enough, but it's worse when it comes to creating, generating alternative discourse. If, if I start with the, with the critical studies, and this lady, Liz Morris, who wrote an interesting paper about the UK, she was like a militant 
fighting against this you know, dominant discourse, human capital theory. And she gave up. She decided to leave academia and fight from outside. I'm not sure whether she's actually generating a counter discourse. Your case speaks to my own experience. I would like to call you by name, but uh, I, w I won't do it. I'll explain later why. <laughs> um, in the 1980s, 1986-1987, one of my colleagues went to a meeting like this. And uh, after presenting a paper like what he did, went to her room. And then I was looking for her when I knocked, and she was in tears, crying for hours. I say, why? I had that word for the first time. They think I'm invisible. And that's the first time, I think it was 1988, when I had. And it spoke to my own experience, too. I used to close the office. All, all the time, close the office. When it's a staff meeting, I would be nervous without knowing what I'm going to do in that staff meeting. And I, at some point, I was also in tears. My supervisor came and asked me, because I was also studying, and asked, what's wrong with you? And I explained. She, she said something that changed my life. Michael, nobody's going to do anything about that. It's dominant, it's there. What are you doing about it? My advice is open your space and occupy it. It changed my life because in all those meetings, I had, in my own way, to affirm my presence. They would talk among themselves, and I would raise my hand. <laughs> I'm still doing it. <laughs> and I would affirm my presence. I would keep my office open. Now, I'm not, this is the empirical level. My question to you is, how do you negotiate that space? Because that's how we actually generate an alternative discourse, a counter discourse. How do you negotiate that? I can give you another minor example. It's one of my students. Because sometimes the problem is not just the dominant discourse, it's ourselves. In that case, I was presenting a paper in the US with all these top scholars squeezing between. He couldn't sleep the whole night. But in the evening, he said, Michael, Let's pray. I will never forget that prayer. In the morning, I, I tell myself to him, I said, why are you so nervous? Do you remember what you said last night? You thought about it, you had a message? Just do it. If you have a message, go and just tell them. He also claimed that that changed his life. I don't know how he went about negotiating in that space. So that's the question for you. Now the question I have for you, which is also related to that, is we understand all these problems of human capital theory. Uh, the most re recent example is social capital that could not explain why is that students coming from a small village like Marapiano, they'll come to Jobbik, to Witz, and become the best students but in terms of social capital, they were out. Sorry, sorry, so let me just finish there. How do we go about engaging with those discourse and the theories generated out of that so that we can open an alternative space? Sorry for, uh, for being too long. I'm gonna come to you, <laughs> another Michael. <laughs> Sue has been saying, please, we have now 40 minutes or so left. I, once again, uh, Andre, where are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That uh, our, our people, all our people here, yeah, yeah, I know that this is uh, great and, and wonderful, but can you just puff and pass? Puff and pass. Yes, true, it's Mission Impossible. Um, thank you, Karkasi. Sue, I hear you. I also hear uh, what, some things that Michael said and Chris. So, um, having heard these, general critique of meritocracy and this uh, summary of experiences and relating of experiences. Um, I think in the room there's an assumption that we 
share an understanding of what this transformation is that we're looking for. But this shared assumption is a really, really big piece of work. Um, it, it's about equality, it's about care, it's about recognition. Um, and if this was to be true, then and taking and listening and hearing what Sue said that you know the universities we are in society but we are certainly neither the vanguard yeah, nor the primary actors in change. We've talked about ontology and epistemology uh, and discourses but I want to talk about practices. What are the practices that we could possibly do which would be trans part of this uh, transformative view? And these practices are quite radical. I mean really smashing the pot I'm talking about, um, well, we would have to get rid of grading if we were going to abolish meritocracy, if meritocracy is uh, the satire that uh, was meant to be a warning that Michael Young wrote about. Uh, that means to get rid of meritocracy. I mean, I teach you know, first year sociology and you know, the most difficult thing to disabuse my students of is the concept of meritocracy. I'm saying sociolo sociologically, this is a bad concept, but nobody believes that. Yeah, they don't think that it's a sociology lecturer's job to say this to you on the first day of your sociology course. So do we get rid of that? Would we get rid of grading of staff and pay grades? Um, so that's a really radical transformation that we're talking about. And would we even call ourselves a university anymore? Because the main way to get rid of all those things would be to um, stop printing credentials. That means the universities would not be in the business of issuing credentials. Degrees, certificates with first class, second upper, second lower, pass. Anyway, that's my puff. Sorry, long. Thank you. I think just being in these spaces, one realizes how, one wounded, how wounded we are. In fact, I've come to a conclusion that universities are hospitals, which are crowded with wounded people. But the sad part is that there is a misdiagnosis of the wounded people. There is also someone who identifies that you are wounded, but they don't know what the red remedy is. And that's the reality that we find ourselves in. But my point, I want to get into a point of appreciating that universities mirrors the society. And what we are experiencing here, it's nothing different from what is happening in society. If you look into South Africa, it's chaos. Your point is, is you talk about creating spaces or communities of coping. And I also want to say, wounded people are able to wound other people. The problem that I'm having, I, I, I think I, I recommend also this in my study that we need these spaces. But a part of me is trying to understand, when we talk about intersectionality, we also need to understand the intra-group dynamics. And when we say black people, we also need to understand the class amongst black people. Colored experience, Indian experience, black experience are totally different. So if we are going to say we are going to bring black people, that on its own have its own challenges. Because the Indian, if I can use that word, and the colored, will tell you something totally different. And the issue of age which we haven't even engaged on. You have Umama who is black like I am, who will tell you, how, how, how do you deal with such? But overall, I, I, I'm picking up something that is coming to the fore, the issue of white fragility. I think the white supremacy, we've touched a bit on that. White fragility, these people have a potential to come to this conversation and they start crying and they make it impossible for us to do what we are supposed to do and we now have to pay attention on these people. How do we deal with those people? And the other thing that comes in, and there are those, the white saviors, 
who come and I see zone save anina. We are here to help you. And we also talk about white exceptionalism, who actually say, yes, we are white, but we are not really privileged. A part of me feels like the white story is missing. A part of me is tempted to say, tell me your white story, your experiences being an academic. Because some of these things, it's like foreign to some people that are white. So I'm not sure how much time you have. Can you tell me your own experiences as an academic? question. Um, yeah, uh, thanks colleagues. Um, and I don't want to preamble my question and, and Kravigas, this one is uh, particularly to you. And it's, it's kind of a flip uh, side of uh, what was asked earlier regarding class and uh, which uh, uh, Sue had uh, responded to. And and, and please, I'm, I'm just asking this one out of naivety, not necessarily because you know, I'm not having the experience of racism and all those uh, kind of discriminations. But I want to ask you if, aren't we at some point overemphasizing the issue of racism when it comes to some of these questions, some? And, and for instance, if you are being patronized in terms of your age, in terms of your height, in terms of your, yes, in terms of blackness, that would be racism. But isn't this also coming from the side of, let's say, if it was me, and uh, uh, kind of patronizing you, uh, you know, kind of this black person, to black male, you know, to black woman, and, um, you know, making you feel the same experience that you would feel when you know it's a white professor at a university you know um, uh, doing all those uh, patronizing uh, approach uh, to your work so but back to the question isn't is it, are we not at some point on some of these overemphasizing the the issue of race Uh, uh, no, uh, no. Uh, listen, you have to blame each other in this room because I want to give... Uh, you want to blame the chair? <laughs> that, uh, we have to take this up uh, in another context because I want to give them three minutes to reflect and pick up this, the sorts of stuff that they want to elaborate on, respond to. Okay, you have three minutes each. How are you guys going to start? Okay, uh, thank you all for your comments. Um, the first one on how to create counter discourses and how do we negotiate the space and I don't know. I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how we do counter discourse and I'm, I mean, maybe it, I, I actually don't know how we do that. But I know that prayer and mantras are not going to get me out of my situation. And I'm not going to grow older anytime soon. I'm not going to look older. So my experiences remain the same. Prayer is not going to get me out of this one. So I, I don't know. I don't know how we create counter discourses without what Sue was saying to confront the materiality of these universities. Our universities are not up here with just knowledge production spaces. They are spaces of work. We are at work. And it is narrating these experiences of working of negotiating in the space, negotiating spaces with students, negotiating our own spaces, and creating, I mean, when I was doing my master's, I, I, I interviewed um, nurses, um, and they were talking about this boundary work, right? When you, do emo when you study emotional labor, look at this boundary work. Constantly negotiating your boundaries. But what I've found in the university space, when the boundaries are not clear, and the boundaries are embedded in institutional culture that are layered by race, that are layered by sexism, by ageism, and by othering, it is very important for you to draw your own line in the sand. So these are the kinds of things that come up for me that prayer cannot rescue me from. Uh, so then the other one of, um, you know, wounding each other. Yes, the university is a place of, you know, being wounded. We are extremely wounded. But it's very important that we speak about it. And, 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 I, and, I, and I agree with you. There are different experiences that must be narrated there. 
and by those who share those experiences. And we, I mean, we might, you know, as you know, they say that we might trigger one another, but it is important that we confront, that we speak, that we say that here I am, I'm visible, I'm here, see me. This is my pain, this is what I'm seeing. So that the university does not remain this pie in the sky, oh yes, no. It is a space for all of us that we negotiate constantly, wounded or otherwise. And I mean, it ties in quite you know, nicely with this idea of nurses who are, wounded, who are wounded carers. We're also wounded teachers who must, whether the wound is inflicted by your very student that you must teach, in my case, when the students were whistling, I must go back and teach because it's coming from different points. But we must narrate those experiences so that the university does not only remain a space of knowledge. When it is not, it is also a space of being of recognizing your being in that space, of constantly owning your space, that I am here, my being is here outside of knowledge production. So, and then the other one on, are we over emphasizing the issue of race? I don't think we're having enough conversations about race. And the interlayered, you know, and how it works out with us being here, with my being specifically, when the particular spaces were not envisaged for me, when I continue, and um, I remember you were talking about racism. I went to your master class, um, and you were talking about it's just this thing. You can't put your finger on it. And it's constantly these things. You walk into a lift, and people start getting tense. Why are you tense? What is, what's, why are you tense? <laughs> why are you tense? And it's, and, and it's, it's almost, and even in my case, it's, all, it's also this ageism. I walk into the space and you immediately assume I'm a student and you can treat me any way you want, but you don't, because I don't have humanity outside of my credentials. If I don't speak up and say, no, actually, I'm a lecturer here, you believe I don't, re I don't deserve the respect because I come as my being into the space. So it is all these niggling feelings of, I just don't know, I don't know, but I don't know why everyone's so tense around me. Everyone was fine before I entered the lift, now I enter, it's tense. So these are these negotiations that I'm trying to bring to the fore. I hope I've answered the questions. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I think if you've always, to speak to you first, Brightness, if you've always been a p in a position of superiority and privilege, then equality feels like an injustice. And that's why, that's why we experience we, speaking on behalf of my entire race group. That is why we experience white frailty. And, and so it's the, the work, as I say, there is work to be done by people who look like me. It's not the job, of course, this being able to confront and draw the line in the sand. I mean, that's absolutely 100% true. But there's work that I, there's work that I can do that speaking to other people who look like me, people who have institutional influence. There's things that I am in a privileged position to say and to confront in ways that my young black colleagues perhaps are less likely to be taken seriously when they say the exact same things. So I need to say those things. Um, and I need to be constantly vigilant about what those things are. And when I made that joke earlier about protected employment, it wasn't a joke. I mean, to confront the fact that there is genuine protected employment of a lot of white academics and this this idea of finding uh, creating spaces of coping I think is fantastic but I also think they then we need to create spaces for fucking up we need to make spaces for making mistakes for doing things wrong and I think that that's where there are a lot of spaces that's white privilege you ask me what my experience of white privilege is that's white privilege I can mess up and I'm having a bad day or yeah but she's you know she's done all these publications so she just got that bit wrong um, and I, I think that a, a, a young black academic probably doesn't have as much space to stuff up. And that's what we need to do. We need to make more spaces. Because if you're not prepared to fail, if you're not prepared to risk, if you're not prepared to say the wrong thing and to get corrected, how can we grow as human beings? So I think that's what I have to do in my space. I also have to learn to shut up a lot more, which is not my strong suit. It's just to be quiet and to listen. But, um, but I'm working on that. But, but about using, using positions of privilege to... to demonstrate when 
when people who have power mess up, how it's not held against them, and therefore to make spaces for other people to mess up. I'm a big believer in failure. I really think that if we're not if we're not casting our universities as places where people can experiment and take risks and try out ideas and mistake and fail and fail again and fail better, then, then we're not universities.